And I'm back with our guest of today's podcast, episode 188 with Dave Short. Welcome to the show, Dave. Hey, it's nice to be back. I didn't realize it was that long ago that I was here before. <laughs> hey, man, when you've been in the business for 46 years, <laughs> a couple of years doesn't mean anything, right? It didn't mean anything, all right. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Yeah, you were on episode 37. That was 150 or so episodes ago, and you gave us so much wisdom back then. You kind of tell us about your story, how you got into real estate, and today I really want to focus on where you're at, but uh, but if you're listening right now, you can go back to episode 37, listen to Dave Short, uh, the legend from Indianapolis, flipped thousands of homes, but Dave, kind of bring us up a little bit. If someone didn't listen to that episode, uh, what have you been doing the last 46 years, man? <laughs> Well, I've done a lot of things in the last 40, 46 years. I've tried a lot of aspects of real estate and, you know, I tend to got focused on flipping as being one of my, my, one of my favorites, um, and things that's associated with flipping. I've also done a lot of training, which I really, really enjoy doing. And hopefully in the next uh, couple of years, we're going to do some more of that. So I'm actually, and we'll talk a little bit about it later in the show, actually delved into developing a office center in Irvington, which is a part of Indianapolis. It's a real hot flippers market also. Interesting. That's, that's crazy. So you are you're got your hands in a lot of different things in Indianapolis, but I know your primary focus has been on flipping houses, uh, rehabbing them, retailing them, putting them on the retail market, selling it to a homeowner. Talk to us about that. Why does that part of the business ex have excited you for so long? Well, we've always liked the, uh, uh, the change aspect of it, where you're taking something and totally redeveloping it and putting it back in the marketplace and seeing the satisfaction of, of what, we's, what we've accomplished and what we've provided to the, to the public here in Indianapolis and central Indiana. So that's always excited us. Um, but like in the, any of our businesses, everything evolves and changes. So with flipping, that's, you know, it's totally, you know, my, my product is totally different today than it was two and a half years ago with, when we talked. Not by choice, but by the necessity of change. Yeah. And I want to talk um, about that because you always have your hand on the market. You're one of the guys that I truly, truly respect when it comes to knowing what's going to happen. I mean, someone that's been in this market for 46 years has seen the roller coaster ride. You've seen the highs, the lows, the changes. And, and now you're talking about the present the last two and a half years is changing. So I want to talk about what is changing with the flipping market and how have you adapted? Well, probably the biggest change that we saw, and it happened prior to two and a half years, it was really starting to happen then, where hedge funds would come in and they were after acquiring a vast rental market. And what was different about two and a half years ago than it is to the type of rentals that they were starting to acquire was, was A rentals and B rentals. And that's our flip market. So consequently, we had to compete against these institutional buyers that would come to our marketplace with millions of dollars and come in and pay what I thought was uh, retail value on these particular properties because they had a different model. You know, if I had their model and wanted to develop rental properties, then yeah, I could go into the, into the marketplace and, and acquire those types of rentals but now we were shut out from trying to acquire these rentals or these types of property as, as flip properties. And when I refer to Vinyl Village, that's houses that were built in mass numbers in one subdivisions. And those were the easiest flips. You know, we could almost drive by a house in certain neighborhoods and know that we would spend fifteen to $20,000 if we had to do everything on the house. Well, consequently, we don't have that access to those kinds of properties uh, unless we get fortunate in an off-market scenario. So what we had to do is start looking for niche markets that the, you know, we tried to figure out what the um, uh, institutional guys wouldn't buy. So that's how we flipped our, our, our 
our uh, flipping business into into these different kinds of markets. For instance, a flipper, uh, an institutional guy wouldn't necessarily buy a condominium. They wouldn't necessarily buy two bedrooms. They wouldn't necessarily buy something with well and septic. Uh, so uh, they wouldn't necessarily buy something over 15 to 20 years old. So what we had to do is number one, figure out what their model was so we could develop a different model that we didn't have to compete with them. You know, I'm a small guy in Indianapolis and we still do 35 houses a year, but we had to, to you know, uh, quench our thirst. We had to look at stuff that they weren't buying because we couldn't compete from a price standpoint. Yeah. I, I think that's so true. I've seen it happen more time and time again. I always reflect on a small town. I'm from a small town and there was always a local grocery store that mom and pop would own and then a big Walmart chain or a big chain would come in and kind of take them out of business. And a lot of that is what they're trying to do is in the real estate market, big companies, big corporations, hedge funds, or now even out West and, and, and other markets. I don't think it's happened in India yet. There's the iBuyers where Zillow is trying to come in. Uh, there's the, um, I think it's called, is it Red Door? Yes. Um, that's an iBuyer buyer that they're making offers with a certain technology uh, formula that they're using. A lot of times they're offering close to retail price, which is hard for us to compete. You know, we're trying to make money because they might only want to make, you know, I'm a wholesaler, so I might want to make um, 6,000, but uh, they might want to make one, you know, and they're okay with that because they're buying in volume. So it really makes it hard. And it sounds like you have had to change your strategy uh, based on that well our strategy is is totally different uh, obviously we look for that property but we have to go into neighborhoods now that you know two and a half years ago i would have never went in i mean a perfect example for the local people in indianapolis is you know a fountain square and a bates hendrix you know we'll go into those locations today two and a half years ago i wouldn't even look at you know look at that location uh, because I just, I disliked reinventing the wheel with a house. And, uh, prior to, you know, our, our first podcast, I pro the most I probably ever spent on a flip was 35 to $40,000. And that was a lot of money. Probably in the last uh, 14 months, I've done probably six flips where I've spent in excess of a hundred thousand dollars to bring the market back. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't like it, but it's necessary to to be in the flip business in the, in the Indianapolis market today. Yeah, definitely. So you've been able to scale your flipping business, which is very, very unusual. A lot of flippers uh, watch the HGTV shows. They might do one flip a year, maybe two, uh, maybe even a few, right? But you're able to do 35 to 40 properties each year consistently, which is a lot because you're flipping these you're fixing them up, you have a plan, you're putting them on the retail market, there's a retail home buyer that's gonna buy it and typically they're getting a loan. So these are a lot longer process than a typical wholesale deal. And you're obviously trying to make more money uh, than a wholesale deal as well. But what are some of the challenges that you see? I know that you do a lot of trainings as well. You host a meetup here in Indianapolis that you've been doing for years. And what are some of the um, things that people want to get into flipping but when they really get into it the reality hits and they're like man I didn't know that this was going to happen or I didn't know this was a part of it what are some of the mistakes that you're seeing people that get blindsided when they get into the retail flipping business well probably some of the things that I, I see in, in my side of the business especially trying to train agents or train uh, flippers is that they, they don't have a very accurate scope of work and they well under, they, they overestimate ARV and underestimate the cost of repairs to do that. And they'll go into projects that take so much more rehab than they're looking at, at doing. And then they're taking a smaller profit margin, you know, as many as we do, we still get bogged down with the cost of getting a home, home completed. 
Now, the difference that's helped us stay on track in these kinds of transactions is that we, we try to conservatively do ARV, an ARV value, even though we think our product will sell at whatever max ARV is. Uh, but, you know, we try not to compromise on what we'll pay for a house just to get a transaction. I would rather let a transaction pass and create, you know, not create a mistake going in. I see so many entry level flippers looking at a product that, you know, there maybe it's 200,000 is their ARV. And when they do their, their due diligence and they, their repair list and scope, then they might be all in at $150,000, but then they forgot to add sales cost on it. They forgot to add holding cost on it. They forgot to add prorated taxes on it. So consequently, if it's a best case scenario on that $200,000 sale price, they may only make twenty dollars or $25,000 on a product. And quite honestly, in rehab, we've, yeah, we, we've seen $25,000 go away uh, the first time you seem like you opened the door. Mm -hmm. uh, every once in a while I get that from my wife. She says, what are you thinking here? You know, am I missing something? <laughs> but uh, so Don't you love my that? wife is my biggest critic, by the way. So uh, God bless her. <laughs> Don't you love that when you buy a deal and the one closest to you is like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We had one, we had one last week and she called, she went by it after I had her put insurance on it and, she says, please tell me it's not this house. <laughs> it's going to be a good one. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So basically what you're seeing is a lot of the people that are new in the flipping, they overestimate the ARV, they underestimate the scope. Um, what I also see sometimes too is they put the ARV as let's say 200,000, but their scope of work doesn't represent a $200,000 house. Correct. They're putting in cheaper quality work where the 200,000 they had granite countertops and they're putting in different ones or you know they're not redoing their kitchen and the 200 they have a nice kitchen right uh so that's some things that i also see um, well we had one where we were actually doing some consulting work on, an, on a flip the mistake had been made and we had out of state investors doing the flip and your first five or six flips you, you, you know, you can't be hands off. You have to be boots on the ground and be there two to three, four times a week if you're in the middle of your first or second flip. So you have to spend the time, number one, so you learn on what mistakes you're making and you can make your subs accountable. And most of the people, they get a good price or flippers from their subs but they don't make them accountable to get the work done on the basis that you want it, you know, you want it done. You know, we, we use this as an example all the time where, you know, the, the flippers have, you know, they've, they've shopped three electricians and the, the one electrician is, is $5,000 more. The other one or is, is a couple thousand dollars more. And the other one is, you know, is a much better price. And he's a, he's a one man show. Mm -hmm. But what they don't take into consideration when you're doing it, that, that scope on the work, does the guy that's hired have five guys and he's going to get it done in four days? Or is the one guy going to come in there and spend a month to get your electrical work done and he's there half the time and he stalls every project? Mm -hmm. And if you're using hard money, it might cost you $1,500 to hold that house the extra month and you've actually lost money. You've lost a lot of money by, by not using the higher priced electrician. Yeah. I even see that with our business today too. People calculate the money, but they don't calculate the time. And a lot of times, even when I pull out the profit, like on the deals, when we wholesale a deal, uh, the profit will be a lot less. And some of the guys, on, even on the team, will say, hey, I thought we were going to make this. And like, well, we had the house for 148 days and that's why, because we're paying costs on all that. We got insurance, we got taxes, we got holding costs and lender interest and all that. And people don't calculate the time and that costs. Yeah, and, you know, consequently, when most of the time, when you calculate the time and the time also reflects a lower sale price, 
Mm -hmm. just because now you're more motivated to get the house sold at a price. So you're consequently, I've got to get this off the books. So yes, I'll, I'll take a less price where if I'd had that home done in 45 days and there wasn't the pressure of the hold, the additional repair costs, the additional taxes that come into this transaction, it, 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 every, everything that we do in flipping plays into the bottom line, mm -hmm. everything. Yeah. And if you don't realize that as a flipper, then consequently your, your, uh, your job gets off track just you know, almost instantly. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to really be a lot better at keeping these jobs on track. And that's hard to do when you're, you know, got seven or eight or nine projects going at a, at a time, but you know, we will, we will master it. It's uh, but it's a tough, it's a tough master. And I see people and flippers that's doing one or two that can't do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I just had two to do, I mean, man, I could stay on time and on budget on everything. You know, but I, I, always relate, I, relate, I relate that to children because when you see all, all of our neighbors have two children and we got four and we're like, man, that's like cake, you know, anybody can do that. <laughs> yeah. I and, mean, uh, I don't know how you keep track of four kids. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think one of the biggest things I keep hearing is accountability. And a lot of times if you're running any team or running crews, that's crucial. And that's hard to do to keep someone accountable, whether it's a crew flipping a house or, you know, someone wanting to lose weight. It's just a hard thing to keep people accountable. Would you say that's like the toughest part of the job with, uh, with flipping? Well, it's one of the hardest jobs for me. Yeah. Uh, because I'm, um, you know, I, I get in a situation where, you know, even as many as we do, I still think I have to do a lot of it. And it seems like every time that I try to delegate out, it just doesn't go well for me. Mm -hmm. Now, part of that's me and I, I get it, you know, and I, I, we're, we're trying to work on it and trying to, trying to change that. But, you know, when our side of flipping accountability is not just with the project, it's with your investor, you know, because most of the, the cost and investments that we do is I've either got a joint venture partner where he's getting a percentage of the profit so I have to be accountable to him to, to get him a return that's expected. So he'll come back in and, and do other transactions. And if we're making, if we had have private money or hard money, we're making a payment on that house. And, you know, if we're making payments on seven houses, then, you know, we lose the half of profitability, 50% of the profitability on one flip every month, just making payments. So all the deals get lopped together. So they don't, they don't think about making the payments on the house. And one of our strategies when we buy private, when we get private money is that, you know, we never defer the interest. You know, I want that product sitting out in front of me and writing checks every month. So I am accountable for that money, whether it's coming out of my pocket or it's less money that my joint venture partner is going to make. You know, we've had tremendous success with, with JVs and we want to keep that, keep that track record. Yeah. And yeah. it's as much keeping them informed in the transaction as it is staying on top of your sides. Yeah, definitely. That's a really interesting about not deferring the interest. And if you're listening out there, uh, kind of what he's talking about is that I work with some private lenders and some of them want monthly payments or, but some of them, you don't have to pay any interest until the end makes it a little bit easier. And that's what Dave's talking about, about deferring the interest on when you sell the house, then you pay all the interest. Right. Uh, right. so I think it just depends on who you are. Uh, but Dave, he says that helps keep him accountable. And I think that's really important when you're writing those checks each month, it kind of boosts your energy and motivation to say, man, I got to get this thing done. This is costing me an arm and a leg each month. Right. Yeah. It seems like every time I get the interest checks from my wife to pay the investors and a lot, you know, I would say half the interest payments that I make to investors, I personally give them the check every month so I can give them a report. Mm -hmm. So I, I can't give them a report and say, oh, we haven't done nothing on the house this month, but we'll get to it next month. You know, I want to be able to tell them we've, you know, we've got to gut it out. 
you know, the drywall is being completed this week. The kitchen cabinets have been ordered. So, and you know, the, so they're more willing to come back because of their, uh, they, they know that their money's working properly for them mm -hmm. on it. Definitely. Well, I want to talk about that just a little bit. So we, we kind of talked about flipping. Sounds like some of the most important things are be conservative, number one, be accountable. You got to choose the right people. And then be, if you're just getting started, be more hands-on. That hands-off thing, that's for someone who really knows what they're doing, maybe like you, Dave. But if you're just getting started, you got to be there with the project. It work. It, it, that still doesn't work for guys like me. We're, we're still very hands-on with our business. I, you know, we have seven, eight projects going right now, and I visit all the projects probably at least twice a week. Well, that's so. awesome. Well, I want to talk about the raising money part because you've been a master at that, been in this business a long time, and you've been able to really accumulate uh, investors to work with you. It seems to be, become very easy to you. People want to invest with you. They want to lend you money, number one. So what's the key to that? What's, uh, what's your kind of secret? Because that seems to be a topic in all the mastermind groups I go to, Facebook groups, whatever it is. People are always asking, especially if they're in the real estate businesses, how can I acquire private money, right? So how, how do you do that? What's your secret? Well, I've got a lot of stuff. I, I took a, a course with Alan Cowhill that uh, was raising private money. And, and I got some really nice tidbits out of that course in taking it. And probably the biggest thing that, that I got out of it is you have to f make your investors feel warm and fuzzy. And if you ask investors, you know, what, you know, what they want, then, you know, the number one thing that they're most concerned about is security. Mm -hmm. You know, they're okay with the deal going south. You know, they just want to know how, I, how I'm going to get my money back, even if I don't make any money on the transaction. Mm -hmm. So one of the, the key things we do with our money is the private money we get, or even JV money, is that, you know, we have enough confidence in our abilities that we will guarantee, you know, guarantees that, in, you know, it's the wrong word to use when you're talking about raising money. But our investors will always get their capital back. Mm -hmm. They may not be guaranteed a return. They won't be guaranteed a return on it, but they will always get their capital back. Probably the last three mm -hmm. years, I've had, you know, maybe four deals that went south and we lost money. And after the end of the the, the transaction, we sat down with our investors and, you know, the biggest check I wrote was $18,000 on a, on a transaction in Fountain Square. Mm. But I said, look, it didn't go like we wanted. We had all these kind of issues and stuff. So here's my closing statement and here's my uh, cost to, to put this house together. We end up losing $18,000. So we wrote the guy a check for $18,000 and give him all of his principal back. Gotcha. So, uh, you know, that's a tough <laughs> thing to do, but it also goes to your credibility with other people and how you, how you raise money. Uh, yeah. I think just having the track record, number one, credibility, doing what you say and keeping them warm and fuzzy. And that doesn't mean you have to, send them a box of chocolates on Valentine's day. Right. But it, it could really just mean giving them a report, keep them updated. Don't keep them in the dark. Talk to yep. them once a month. Right? We, we've, we had a, we've got a transaction that's not going well as we're going to, we're going to make a profit, but it's not going near as well as I thought it would. And, you know, once I realized that this, this project was going to have some issues, I immediately met with my investor and say, Hey, here's where we're at. And it doesn't look like this product's going to do that for these reasons. And he, he was a novice, but yet he still appreciated me going back to him. And I actually, I said, do you want to switch over from a JV to an interest only guy? Or do you want to just ride with me? And I give him the decision to ride. And he, he rode with me on the, on the transaction. So we're going to make money, not as much as he would have made had he, had he flipped over to an interest only type loan. But he's, he's, he's happy. He said, oh, I guess I should have done the other way. And I said, well, we'll do well on the other one. And he said, yeah, as soon as we get out of this one, we'll go into one that will 
bit better. So the next one he goes into, I will make sure it will be a, a better transaction than, than this one. So, but you know, and word of mouth gets out there and, you know, running in the right circles helps. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't have to pound people for money to get money. Mm -hmm. You just kind of talk to them what you do. And, you know, I said, you know, we do stuff with joint ventures. We do stuff with hard money. You know, kind of my rule of thumb is if you want to be a joint venture partner with me, you've got to be a lender first mm -hmm. for one or two houses just to see if you like the process. And I know you're going to be guaranteed income on your money. Yeah. So we bring them in as, as interest only partners. Uh, first of all, before they, I let them be a joint venture. So okay. they just think they like the process. Well, that's great. I mean, I, you've done so well at that. And again, I think it, it really just means a lot just running in the right circles and to talk to people about your business. And that's, that's the one thing that we've been able to do. And, uh, it's not a hard sell, right? It, um, it really, you know, people don't understand that it's really a not sell, not a hard sell. Uh, especially if they don't think you need the money. Right. I mean, it's an easy sell. They don't think you need the money. <laughs> you know, you're just a, you're just accent or helping accentuate their business and going forward. Definitely. So, well, Dave, I want to transition. We've talked about raising money. We've talked about flipping, but now uh, you're entering a stage where you're doing some different things. You, you always seem like uh, we talked about, you sometimes have that shiny object syndrome, but you've been very successful with some different niches as well. So talk to us about what you're doing now. Uh, what are a couple of the projects you're, you're up to? Well, one of the things and one of the niches that I, we're getting into, we've just done our fourth one in the past uh, 11 months, and I'd like to do 10 more in the next year if possible, is that we're buying some of our stuff and we're, we're basically creating notes. And, you know, that from my point of view, that's like the best deal ever. I mean, it's the best way to go after new business and create cash flows and you don't have um, you don't have to fix toilets mm -hmm. and uh, you don't get calls in the middle of the night of something going wrong with the house uh, so you become basically you become the bank i know you had uh, justin on a couple weeks ago and he does a lot of note business and very you know very good at it in indianapolis there's a couple other guys but um we like going and create the notes and it's kind of a long process to explain on kind of how I do the note business, but we create actually three streams of revenue by creating one note. And it's, it's really kind of cool. And you can make a lot of different, make income three different ways by creating one note in our marketplace. So, and I, I really like that. Yeah. So I know yeah. we've had some other guests on the, on the show. Um, they've talking about Justin Bogart. We can put his uh, podcast in the show notes at simplewholesaling.com forward slash episode 188. And, um, and, and we do it as well, but it's just, it is a great way. You literally become the bank. And Dave, since you've been doing this for so long, I mean, do you wish that you would have started doing that earlier in, in your life? If, if I had to go back, I wish I would have started doing this day one. Yeah. And it might have been the only thing that I did. <laughs> I mean, that's how much I like this, this aspect of it. That's awesome. And, you know, every, uh, people come to my meetup, um, once a month, you know, we kind of go over these trans, these types of transactions and, and really break them down in detail. And with this note, when we did it uh, about three weeks ago at our, at our meetup and I, I broke it down and what we made on this one transaction and it was almost double what I would have made had I flipped this house. Wow. And the people's eyes were just, you know, they were bugging out. People come up and said, that's unbelievable. You know, how'd you think of that? I said, you know, I don't know. We just pieced different aspects of what, you know, we took prior knowledge and pieced it together in one simple transaction. Yeah. So, and I love it too. I, if you're listening out there, it, if you can use this as a tool, uh, if you're just getting started, maybe you need to do something with this, but it's a great tool for us because we're already getting deals. It's just another exit strategy for us. But I'm always thinking as I get older about cash flow because I don't want to grind it out all the time. 
and Dave, I know the flipping business too is just like wholesale or wholetail. It's it's well, a we're I mean we we still really love the flipping business, but we also as we do it more and more, and you get to certain ages, that uh, the transactional business is very tough. And by transactional, I mean once we uh, close it, you know, once we close the house and we get paid a profit, we're done with that. If I don't find another flip, I don't make any more money next month. Mm -hmm. so consequently you know the the transactional is a very it's very time consuming where you know once you get you know up to 15 or 20 of these notes then all of a sudden you've replaced every month you know you have to do two less flips and you have the same amount of income yeah so it's really pretty cool yeah that's awesome what, what else are you doing? I know you uh, had renovated an office building and that's a huge project that you've undertaken. And what's that all well, about? Well, we bought, um, uh, Syria came to me to uh, help, help them find a location for their headquarters. So we found a building on the east, on the east side of Indianapolis in the Irvington location, which is a high, being starting to be a highly developed uh, location. And you know, when we did the uh, surveys and checked if this is going to be the right location for us and the type of building, uh, we found out that Irvington didn't have any meeting spaces. They didn't have any place to have weddings, uh, receptions after weddings, corporate events, corporate meetings. And this building with Syria there, because we had to remodel the space for them to have a meeting space for 200 people, we just figured we would adapt that. And I brought in another team member uh, who has, has owned co-working space and still owns, owns and operates co-working space. And his name's Taylor Jennings, and we brought him in to develop our co-working space. So we're about uh, 30 days away as of this recording to have our co-working space open. And uh, our goal is to really have it as a real estate incubator. Mm. and have small guys that want to meet and be able to see other people to bounce ideas off of. And, you know, I, you know, over the course of the years, I kind of wished I had guys to bounce ideas off more than I did, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we're going to, we're going to get to that look, you know, get to that place. I mean, one of the best uh, masterminds I went was a couple of weeks ago with you and, you know, where we got to, to bounce a lot of ideas off a lot of top people in their industry mm -hmm. that, that do this every day. And, you know, they, these people talk about scaling. Well, I don't necessarily want to scale, but I want to get more detailed and organized in what I, what I do. So if I do things like these guys did without trying to scale, then you can almost do it in your sleep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah a lot of the, a lot of the stuff is just being more efficient. So maybe it's not about getting bigger. It's about getting better. Number one, and it might not, not even be about doing more deals. It might be just being able to scale your life, scale your time. And that's right. one thing that. Well, and the event center is kind of one of those things in Irvington. I mean, quite honestly, if I look back at it now, you know, it was the bright, shiny object syndrome. I bit off more than I should have, but I'm happy that I did. It's going to be a, a, a really good project for the east side of Indianapolis. And it's in the opportunity zone. It's three acres. You know, we've got two buildings. So there's just a lot going on to this building and to see the transition of this building is, is just amazing. That's awesome. So just a couple of things about the building is number one, you were searching for a place for Syria, which is the central Indiana real estate investors association which is the largest uh, RIA in Indianapolis. And they have, I don't know how many members they have, Dave, do you? We've got just over, they've got just over 800 members now. 800 members. So it's a large yes. RIA. So you're looking for a place for a RIA and you found one that's awesome, but then you transformed it to make more money by turning it into a co-working space, which is great. And if you're an entrepreneur out there and you can't work out of your house and you're, you can't have an office. Those co-working spaces are great. Uh, so they're going to be open up that as well at this, uh, in Irvington. And you also can rent it out for meeting places and weddings. So you guys turned this expense into 
a pretty big money opportunity, honestly. Well, it's, it's Syria is because an organization like Syria can pay a certain amount of rent, but you know, they struggle to keep the doors open and keep the memberships going. And they, you know, Vicki Perry, who's our um, executive secretary there and kind of operates it, but she's built this organization from 150 members to 800 members. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of synergy going on. And twice a month now, we have major meetings there and we have people from all over the country come in and speak and give their, uh, tell us what they do and how they do it. And, you know, sometimes they're what they call podium selling, which is fine. Uh, but you still get two to four hours worth of information for, for cost of membership. And yeah. you have access to guys like me. They have access to guys like you. I know you have a meet up there once a month that has, you know, 50 to 70 people coming to learn your business. And, you know, that's one of the things I like about your company and, and my company is that, you know, people think that if you give back to our industry, you're training your competition. And that is so far from the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, you're actually training your partners. Yeah. And how to be good partners. That's a good mindset, right? an abundance mentality. And yeah, it's so great. So Syria is great. Uh, Dave has his meetup. We host our meetup the fourth Wednesday of each month at the Syria building. So we use that as well. And we're going to put this information in our show notes again at simplewholesaling.com forward slash episode 188. And Dave, we're running into the part of the show that we like to call going deep. We're there already. We, we are there already, that, man. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're 35 minutes in the show, man. We just, hey, we could be here all day. But um, I have two questions for you. Number one, I asked this earlier in the show, but again, I think it's so important. I love asking people that are older than I am uh, just about life in general, personal questions or personal growth questions or business questions as well. You've been doing this for a long time. And again, what's one thing, or if you want to name a couple of things that you wish that you would have done differently over the past 46 years? Well, I would have developed my faith much quicker and got into that. Um, you know, my, my life changed and become so much better when I developed my, started to develop my faith. And that was just eight or nine years ago. Mm. You know, I was a running ragged guy and now I'm, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty laid back, pretty calm. And, you know, people don't see the stress on my face, but you know, you know, we all have it, but, I know where it's all going, mm. so it doesn't um, doesn't impede me. And, but that's had I, had I, you know, I would be much farther along today had I developed my faith, you know, 30 years ago, 40. Years. I mean, you can't pick a year, yeah. you know, yeah. because it's so it's so blessed going forward. Do you feel like as you get older, you you just start to think about that more? And when you're 20 to 30. You know, I always, it, it was kind of weird. I always thought about it, but I, um, uh, I just thought you could always put it in the future. Mm. I always put it in the future. Yeah. And um, so, it, it, and had I not done that, I mean, and, and you know, my values was always based on godlike principles, but I didn't study and I didn't understand it. Um, you know, so I always had a good life and I always had a good reputation, you know, because of those things. And, you know, I, I literally wouldn't do anything to anybody else that I, I without, you know, letting them know. You know, profit's a good thing, you know, but it needs to be done properly. Yeah, definitely. Well, that's a great, that's a great answer. I was not uh, expecting that one. That's <laughs> awesome. And we're obviously a Christian faith filled company and we think the exact same way. And, um, that's awesome, man. I know I saw you at uh, something that I really loved. It's called the Great Banquet. Uh, that was what I don't know, a few few years ago. It's about three years ago now, three and a half yeah. years ago. So I saw you. I went to that and saw you kind of going through, and I didn't know you were there, and I thought that was pretty awesome. That was just a great experience. Um, 
but so that's, that's amazing, man. So if you're listening out there, just listen to, uh, to the wisdom of that. And I think it's just so important to seek something that is beyond ourselves, beyond this business, because at the end of the day, I mean, we all know, I mean, we all, we all know it's just, it's, it's yeah. not class. It's all going away. Right. Right. <laughs> so, and that's just, well, it doesn't go away. That's what's really good about it. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. What about business wise? What's one thing you would have uh, done different? Um, you know, I would have, I would have probably tried to um, hook up or partner with somebody that, uh, that basically worked with my, with my talents so I could work with their talents. Mm. And uh, I mean, you've, you've picked people around you to work with your talents so you could go, you know, so you could do what you need to do and want to do. Cause I know you enjoy being a visionary and I enjoy being a visionary. I enjoy being an idea guy. I enjoy structuring, but I never had the person that would, you know, put a stop gap on me and say, Hey, let's get this done before we go here. I love this, but let's go here. I never got that guy. And, uh, I don't know if it was a lack of trust or I just felt, uh, so I felt my abilities were so good. I didn't need that, mm -hmm. but I, I found out that, you know, had I done that, you know, things and no complaints here, but things would have probably been a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the entrepreneur, sometimes they get their mind wrapped around this idea of freedom. At our last meetup, I was talking about scaling the wholesaling business and just talking about my journey and what this past year has been, hiring Brian as the COO, being able great to- move, Great business. move, by the way. Thanks, Dave. Uh, and being able to get out of the business, probably I'd say a good 70% where, from where I was at. And it's been really great. But some people said, well, what if uh, I, I just enjoy the business? I, I enjoy working. Like, what if I don't want to get out of it? And I said, you know, everybody's vision's different. Like, you don't have to get out of it if you don't want to. If you like doing it, then do it. You know, don't do what I do or anybody else. But I think that's just so important that we don't have to follow what everybody else is doing. People talk about freedom, working four, four hours a week and stuff like that. But if that's not what you want, you don't have to do that. If you want to stay in the business, then do that, right? Well, it's a beauty of this business is that, you know, that I know, should I want to retire or slow down, you know, if I wanted to flip two or three houses a year and put younger guys or gals under my tutelage to do that, you know, I can easily do that and, and enjoy all aspects of it without the daily grind. Mm -hmm. You know, we have several people that we're, you know, we're maybe trying to do that with. Yeah. So it's a real easy, my business is a real, it's a, it's a hard business to get to retirement, but it's a real easy to business to be in retirement. If that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. So last question. Uh, so I asked about your past, what would you do different? So I, I think you're coming up on certain age and you're looking in the next five years, 10 years. Uh, what do you see with you and your wife in the next five or 10 years? Well, you know, my wife and I, I mean, my wife is, as I am, devoted to our grandkids and they're a, you know, a great part of our lives. So, you know, we're, we're now at a part in our life that when something comes up and we want to do it, you know, we'll do it, it's, you know, especially with my kids and, and my grandkids to do that. Uh, we still have to adapt our lifestyle uh, to um, be where we want to be, where you know we, these things can be done at just just at a turn. And um, I mean, the perfect example is me sitting here today. I'm getting ready to go into a poker tournament. That's what I do, you know. And uh, you know, I just told my wife last night. I said, I'm gonna go up. I'm gonna go down to Louisville and play in a poker tournament tomorrow. Okay, I'll see you later. You know, type thing. So, um, but and. You know, we've got all the pieces and all of our houses are getting worked on, getting finished. So I don't need to be there to do that. Yeah. And that's one of the, you know, one of the things I really enjoy about, you know, about this business. And as we develop more and more notes, it will be even easier. As we develop the uh, Syria Business Center or Event Center, it will be, it will be much easier. 
yeah. to, to make those kinds of decisions. Definitely. So. That's awesome. You know, and I, yeah, if you hear that, uh, some of the sound in Dave's background, yeah, he's at a uh, poker tournament getting ready to, so good luck, Dave, at that. Thank like, you. What, hope you win. What's the take if you win? Uh, first prize today will probably be around 38000 Wow. Have you ever so, won a poker tournament? I have. Okay. I've had. I've had a couple $20,000 caches, a couple $15,000 caches, and come close on others, but not been there yet. <laughs> but I can tell you about just how I'm focused on this. It's, you know, poker's it, – you have to train for it just mm -hmm. like you train to be a flipper. And I spent three days last month in Las Vegas training with the top tournament poker players in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was amazing how much I learned when I thought I was pretty good at this business. <laughs> yeah. So I think whatever you're doing, you have to continue to learn. I feel like one of the things that I totally regret was when I first got into the business, I read a lot of books, took some courses, but there was probably a, a good four or five years where I stopped doing all that. I didn't go to any RIAs, stopped learning, no books, no courses. And I really became stagnant uh, because the market was changing, but I wasn't right. And I just think you have to continue to right. go uh, with that. That's awesome. Well, Dave, it has been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show today. And I'm going to end uh, today's show just like we end every show with a little touch of randomness. So uh, I picked three random questions for you here so name the first thing that comes to your mind on these number one uh what is your and you might have already said this already but what is your favorite passion well i'm uh, besides uh you know my faith my grandkids it gets to poker and golf poker and golf so i didn't know you were a golfer yeah i'm um i'm a you know, it's kind of like anything I can gamble at, I'll probably do it. <laughs> I, mean, I can have a good time pitching quarters. <laughs> and it's probably a good place to raise money, too, at the golf club. You know, I would say a third of my um, uh, investors uh, play poker with me weekly. Yeah. And uh, another 20% play golf with me weekly. That's awesome because those are gamblers, too. So they're, they're not afraid those of the risk. Are, those are gamblers also. <laughs> That's great. All right, number two, what is one of the stupidest things that you've ever done? One of the stupidest things I've ever done. Um, you know, probably 20 years ago, I bought an office building on the east side of Indianapolis. Now, I just told you about the event center that I just bought. It's not the stupidest thing, but I bought an office building on the east side of Indianapolis, not knowing anything. And me and a partner just went through that and we, uh, we, we had, had the problem solved and then 9-11 happened. And all of my tenants and everything went away overnight. Wow. So I had an office building that was going to um, make me several thousand dollars a month into making a $200,000 loss. Wow. Wow. Literally overnight. Wow. And, you know, I learned a lot from that in, in this planning stages and getting out of your, um, you know, getting out of your lane. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've got a lot of lanes and I can stay in a lot of lanes pretty comfortably, but I also can get out of lanes and yeah. as any investor can. And I was way out of my, way out of my lane. <laughs> that's it, it goes on the stupidest thing i've ever done. <laughs> uh, thanks for sharing dave all right last one if you could lock one person in a mental institution who would that person be man that's not a fair question there's uh, <laughs> um, one person in a mental institution um you know i, I don't know that i I've got a couple individuals that I've been in business with. If I could put them in an institution that I would. <laughs> and, uh, but I would never, I would never name their names because things went really bad. And, you know, after uh, we've forgiven them and going down the road. And so it, it's, you know, it, you know, I kind of looked at it at the time I would have put them in an institution. 
But now I look back on that and I said, if, if they hadn't come along without question, I, would, I wouldn't be where I was at today. Mm. I mean, God put these people in my life with the positives and with a lot of negatives that I had to go forward with. Yeah. So, That's good. It's, it's all learning experience. It's all learning experience. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, hey, Dave, we are out of time, man. I appreciate you so much, uh, just your wisdom. And I've gotten so much out of our relationship over just the past year or two, uh, being able to do the radio show with you, which is now turning into a podcast, the Real Talk uh, radio show, uh, Real Talk about real estate investing. And just talking about deals and just getting to know where you're at. I'm entering a new stage in my life, and it's just refreshing to talk to someone who gets it. Yeah. Well, I love being able to reach out to people like you, whether it's you or any anybody on your team and other people that, that you know, everybody needs somebody to talk to and you, you need to have those people in your life that will call you back. Yeah, definitely. So, and I appreciate you for that. Yeah. Well, thanks, Dave. But I want to give you one last opportunity. If someone is investing in Indy, wants to come to one of your meetups, uh, you know, whatever that looks like. Can you give out your information so someone can, uh, can reach out if they need to? Probably the best way to reach me is through my email. Uh, as you found out today, trying to get this podcast set up, that I'm not very tech savvy. Uh, <laughs> but email is probably the best way to reach me. And it's D short S at C21 sheets, S C H E E T Z dot com. Great. Well, I can, uh, and you know, get my number through there and call me. Uh, if you call me, I will return your call. Great. Well, thank you so much. And to all our, all of our listening audience out there, you can see that information and all of these show notes on our website at simplewholesaling.com forward slash episode 188. And that's a wrap with Dave short. Thank you so much, Dave. God bless you, ma'am. I appreciate it.